Hi, I'm Melissa. And I'm Joe. Thank you so much for coming out to worship with us today. We're so glad to have you here at Victory Church. If you could please make your way to your seats, our service is about to begin soon. Hey, and if you're checking us out through live stream, thank you so much for joining Victory Church. Drop a comment and get the conversation started. At Victory Church, our mission is to connect people with Christ, with family, and with purpose. We know that God is going to do something great in your life today.
you, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. We praise you, Lord. We thank you that we can look to you as a beacon of hope. You are the light in the darkness. 
We praise you, Lord. We will sing your praises forevermore. We love you, Lord. We honor you today. We are so grateful to be believers in Jesus Christ. Hey guys, Pastor Petey here. We're so glad that you've tuned in for this online worship experience. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. We're gonna dive into God's word in just one second, but first, we wanna give you an opportunity to sow into God's kingdom. There's several different ways that you can get involved today. First of all, you can get involved through text message. If you text the word, our victory, that's all one word, our victory, to the number 77977. You can also give through our website at ourvictory.org. You can give through the Our Victory app as well, and you'll find the link for it in the comment section below. Also, checks can be sent here to the church, and we will post the address in the comment section. Now, let's dive into God's Word. Hi, I'm Pastor Debbie. Welcome to the live stream tonight. Um, those of you who are part of our Victory family here that come on a regular basis, um, we just welcome you. And um, it's just good to say that we can still be together. You may be on your couch, you may be at your kitchen table, you may be comfy in your jammies, laying in bed, wherever you are, we're all together for this time. Um, so thank you. And for those of you joining us for the first time, um, we hope to see you when we actually do get, be able, when we actually are able to be back together. Anyway, um, I wanted to just exhort you for a moment today. I was thinking, you know, with all of this unsettling times going on, I'm thinking, Lord, what words do we have in our heart? Do we know your word, those of us who are Christians, those of us who know Jesus? Do we have your word hidden in our heart? So that number one, like David says, that we might not sin against you, but, but also do we have your word in our heart so that we can pull up a scripture to help us in a fearful time, in the times of pestilence, in the end times, in the last times? Do we have that word that can bring comfort and strength and joy, the word that we can proclaim and pray in power and authority, knowing that we're able to curse this virus in the name of Jesus and that we can stop it in its tracks and we can thank God, not in our own strength, but because he's given us power in his word. Do we have a word from God to comfort another? Do we have a, do we have a word that can bless your neighbors in this time when they're fearful that can bless the community, the people that you work with, whoever you do come in contact with. We don't know how long this is going to last. We pray that it's short. But anyway, so I just wanted to say, now is a good time. Examine your heart. Get in your Bible. Get into the Word of God because He alone has the words of life. And we need life more than anything right now. Um, just to share a little story, years ago, and I don't remember where I even got it, but I had a soap dispenser that had a scripture on it. And I thought about it this week. The scripture is Second uh, Chronicles 7.14. And it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, will I answer from heaven and I will heal their sin forgive their sin, and heal their land. When I, I was thinking about it because I was washing my hands, and of course I don't have that soap dispenser from a gazillion years ago, but I was thinking about it as I'm washing my hands, and I'm like, that's when I learned that scripture, when I was washing my hands. And the thing is, is that, you know what? Yes, we need healing from the coronavirus. We need it to stop. We need it to end. But there's other healing that we need too. We need healing from the virus in our heart. What is a virus in our heart? It's our own selfishness and self-sufficiency. And if anything, if there's anything that we can learn from this time now, this season that we're in, as short or as long as it may be, is that we need the power of God. We don't need the power of self. And I think we're all being shown that. I think we're all being shown that we cannot lean on our own understanding. 
the scripture says, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. We need him to direct our path minute by minute, don't we? We need him to direct our path. And you know what? When we lean on our own understanding, it's like propping up all of our body weight, and some of us weigh a lot, all of our body weight on our own thoughts, on a stick, on a stick. That's what, that's what leaning on your own understanding is. We cannot be propped up by a stick. And so let's not lean on our own understanding. Let's pray. Let's ask God. Let's search our hearts. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and show me in the way everlasting. The more that we can give up to God, God is the one that says, I am. He's the one who roots stuff out of us so we can have more of him in us, so we have more of the light and the word to proclaim to the world, to the lost and the dying and the hopeless. As we give ourselves to him, as we bow the knee to him, as we say, Jesus, forgive us. Father, forgive us. We need you. We need you. We need you. And we can say it a hundred times. We need you. And call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things, says the Lord. So we need to fall upon our face, and we need to seek God and ask him, what do we need to heal, to bring of this virus into a place of health? How do, what do we need to bring something from a place of sickness? A virus brings sickness, right? So to bring the sickness to a place of health, a place of wholeness, a place of functioning as the body of Christ, the way we're supposed to function. We're supposed to be the salt and the light. We're supposed to be the hope and the example. And I pray that God finds us that way today and in the next season ahead. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The Lord says, I am. He is I am. He's the all-sufficient one. He's the healer. He's the protector. He's the life giver. He's the defender. He's the rock and the refuge and the tower of strength that we run to in things like this. He didn't say you are. He said, I am. I am that I am. And I am that I am can live in you. So just be encouraged tonight. Um, we love you. We're praying for you. It's hard to not be together. But when we do come together again, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. And I pray now that people who have taken the house of the Lord for granted will appreciate it, will, will realize what our brothers and sisters in other countries and nations and lands do not have the privilege of. And now we're getting a teeny tiny little eensy weensy taste of it. And it's nothing like the persecuted church is going through. So let's be sensitive to that. God bless you. I love you. I can't wait to see you again. And let me just take one minute. Welcome my husband, Pastor Pete. Okay. Thank you, my dear. All right. So good to be. So great to be here tonight with you. Although I can't see you, I know you're out there. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a virtual hug tonight. So thank you for joining us on our wonderful live stream tonight as we dive into God's Word. And we're going to talk about the fact that if it can be said that all of life is like a voyage, then it stands to reason that sometimes life will have calm seas, at other times will be tempestuous, stormy seas, unpredictable currents, unpredictable tides, and even at other times, our compass may get totally lost and our compass heading uh, is, goes crazy. Well. Here we are in 2020 with our coronavirus uh, pandemic gripping the whole world. And so therefore the whole world is all of a sudden just like that seemingly brought onto a ship that has entered into the stormiest of seas. President Trump said that this thing is so profound that he 
considers himself a, to be a wartime president with, in this case, fighting against an enemy that has no face. And though that's true, we all find ourselves in the same situation tonight. We are in this together. So what I'd like to do, this is part one of a two-part series. Part one tonight, we're going to be looking at 10 lessons from Paul's voyage on the Titanic. Now, you know in Acts chapter 27, Paul went on this voyage, this very ill-fated voyage, headed for Rome. He was going to stand before the emperor and give an account for his life, uh, having been charged with different crimes. And here he is, gets on this uh, ship, and he's making his way up to Rome, essentially as a captive, and then everything tears loose. And that's the way life is sometimes. We can have everything charted out, just like the sailors did, uh, who had made the voyage many times before, and they take Paul on this journey, and all of a sudden, everything goes crazy. However, I would like to start at Psalm 91, because this is what we really need to wrap our heads and our hearts around tonight. This is exactly what wound up happening to Paul, despite the destruction on this voyage. Psalm 91, verses 9 to 16. The psalmist says, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. Remember that, dear friends. You trust in Christ. No evil will befall you. Nor shall any plague, plague come near your dwelling. Nor any virus come near your dwelling. Believe it. Trust God. For he shall give his angels charge over you. See, one of the things that Paul experienced on this journey was that an angel of the Lord appeared to him and gave him a life-saving word, not only for Paul's life, but for every man on board that ship. Thank God for the Lord. Thank God for his angels. The Lord has given his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. In their hands they will bear you up, lest you even dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And this is what the Lord says about us, about those who love him. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, or I will deliver her. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and we all have times of trouble. Right now we are all in trouble. We are all in tempestuous seas. The Lord says I will... Be with him in trouble, I will deliver him, and I will honor him. With long life I'll satisfy him, and I will show him my salvation. Another way to saying that, I will show him my saving hand, my deliverance in his or her life. Now, if you know anything about Paul's journey, as I outlined it just a moment ago, he was taken captive, and here he is leaving from Israel, and he's going to make his way up along the shores of Israel, and then past Lebanon, and then across. And long story short, he was headed for Rome, as I said, to stand before the emperor. And then everything started going wrong. But I want you to parallel life's journey with what Paul went through. And the things that we need to pay attention to, and I would say particularly now, as we are all embarking on this journey in uncharted waters, an unprecedented kind of battle that the world has not seen in a hundred years. And here we are, we find ourselves for such a time as this, dealing with this. So, let's go. Ready? Roman numeral chapter 2, I'm sorry, Roman numeral 2 says, 10 takeaways from a trip gone bad. And as I said before, we're going to cover five of these. Part 2, we will cover the final five. But there are takeaways one step at a time that we can extract from Paul's experience on this stormy voyage. Number one is this. Spiritual discernment is crucial in our lives. Spiritual discernment is crucial in our lives. And you can see the scripture, Acts 27, verses 9 and 10. It says, Now one, when much time has been spent... And sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. 
And the fast, of course, being late September, early October, he's really referring to the Day of Atonement. After that great feast, it was late September, early October. This is when the seas started uh, historically getting very stormy and very unpredictable. So the Bible says that when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was over, Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive, you see that word perceive, really is an internalized kind of word. It's a spiritual word. It's a word that uh, is deal, deals with something more that's sensed than something that can be mathematically um, added up. So he said, I perceive, I sense in my spirit that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Now guys, we're going through a very tough time. We're going through, as I said before, an unprecedented kind of battle. It's very important that in this journey, we get an ear to hear from the Lord. It's very important that we ask of God, and believe that he will answer us, where to go, what not to go, what to listen to, what to do, how to handle ourselves, not only in this crisis that we're all facing now, but also in life itself. Spiritual discernment is a very critical part of successful living. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 12, that the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord has made them both. And I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a good prayer to pray. Lord, give me the seeing eye to see the way you do. Give me the hearing ear to be sensitive to your voice. And give me a spirit that is sensitive and discerning to times, seasons, and situations. Because our eyes can deceive us, as we're going to see in just a moment. Uh, facts can seemingly deceive us. Natural circumstances can throw us off. We've got to grow in spiritual discernment more than ever in this stormy time in which we live. That's number one. Let's go to number two. The second thing that we need to extract from Paul's experience, and you notice who stood up in that first point was Paul. Paul stood up in the midst of a bunch of unsaved sailors and said, I spiritually discern that we're in trouble. And these were experienced nautical people that laughed at him and took him as a joke. Number two. During difficult times, be very careful what voices you listen to. During difficult times, be very careful what voices you listen to. Because you, everyone will have an opinion. You'll hear voices coming from all over the place. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Apostle Paul said from the King James Bible, uh, there are many voices in the world. Obviously, the word there is not so much just voices shouting. This says there are many languages in the world. However, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 8, that if the trumpeter does not blow a certain sound, let me rephrase, if the trumpeter blows an uncertain sound, then how can they rally and prepare for battle? And what he's referring to there is in the Roman Empire, they had this thing down to a science where some people speculate that they had as many as 40 different configurations of sound that a trumpeter would blow. And each one of them sent a different message to the troops. And so can you imagine if the guy had a real bad day and he was blowing a trumpet configuration that told the troops charge when he should have blown the one that said retreat because we're in trouble. And so there are many voices in the world. There are so much noise. We're getting bombarded every moment of every day with information and people saying this and that and all kinds of news outlets. And sometimes we just need to quiet down, turn those things off, and get an ear to hear the Lord. Because there's hysteria in our country being manifested in our grocery stores and different places because people are feeding off of bad news. They are feeding off of negative reports uh, incessantly. And this is causing a big, big problem because no one's heart is at peace after hearing more and more and more bad news. We're not capable of taking all of that in and sorting it out. We take it in and it shipwrecks our internal peace. So in this time, 
Be careful of the voices you listen to. Say, Lord, let me hear your voice. Because his voice, listen, his voice is the voice that will calm the storm for you. Jesus, his voice, spoke to the wind and the waves and said, peace, be still. And immediately they obeyed him. He'll do the same for you and I. Look at the scriptures, Acts 27, verses 11 and 12. It says, nevertheless, see, Paul said, we're in trouble. Our, our, our voyage is going to be in trouble. But look at how the Bible says, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and by the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, which was a harbor of Crete near Greece, uh, opening toward the southwest and the northwest, and they could winter there instead. But I want you to notice in, this, in these two verses that the centurion heard Paul, but he was more persuaded by the helmsman. Not only the helmsman, but he was more persuaded by the owner. Well, what would the owner's voice count for? Because the owner owned the ship and the owner owned all of the wheat. It was probably a wheat cargo that was on this thing. And guess what? That guy wasn't going to lose money no matter who had to die or potentially die in this process. So the centurion listened to the helmsman. The helmsman listened to the owner. And then if you read in the third sentence, and the majority advised, let's go for it, let's set sail. How many of you know that the majority can very often be wrong? Just because everyone seems to be saying it, that doesn't make it true. The helmsman was wrong, the owner was wrong, and the majority were all wrong, and it almost cost everyone their lives. Be very careful the voices you listen to. Appearances can be deceiving. Why? Sometimes the devil, he's a master at making the grass look greener on the other side of the hill, and that's what happened to these guys. See, the little harbor, referred to in verse 12, was indeed safe for the ship, but it didn't seem good enough for most of the crew. Then in verse 13, the weather actually seemed better than it actually was. That was deceiving. See, those men did not see what was right around the corner, did they? They sailed out of that harbor right into harm's way. They sailed right into a storm that could have been avoided, but they didn't listen to the right voice. It reminds me of the Titanic. Same thing on our maiden voyage in 1912. It was the classic case of a tragedy that could have been avoided. The ship was originally designed to carry 60 lifeboats, but, but they were so sure that it could never sink they cut that number to 40, then 32, and finally they were down to 20 lifeboats, a third of what they should have carried. Then they sailed full speed ahead into an area known to have ice. Now here's the tricky part. The thing that really destroyed them was the fact that the seas were calm. And because the seas were calm, they could not see waves awkwardly crashing against something and so when the waves hit the iceberg, because everything was calm, the waves were small, the guys could not really see any kind of disturbance up ahead. Not to mention the fact they didn't have any binoculars. But the ship California tried to warn the Titanic, but the Titanic actually cut off their message before it was finished being uh, transmitted because it interfered with regular communications that they wanted to get on with from Newfoundland. Then after the Titanic hit the iceberg, many lifeboats, they pulled away from the ship with only half, only half full. But the biggest error was their arrogant attitude. Not even God could sink this ship was what was said of the Titanic. And of the 2,200 people on board, only 700 survived and 1,500 people died. All of that death and destruction could have been avoided had they listened to a different voice. But it's been noted that because of arrogance and because of a reputation that they wanted to have, the owner and the captain, 
They just steamed on full speed ahead, despite the fact that there are iceberg warnings all over the place. They wanted to get to New York in record time and be big shots. Let's go to number three. The third thing we can take from Paul's journey is this. We've got to trust God's word and not be fooled by circumstantial evidence. We've got to trust God's word and not be fooled by circumstantial evidence. Where do we get that? Well, we get that from Acts 27, verses 13 and 14. Acts 27, verses 13 and 14, it says this, when the south wind blew softly, and you might want to pay attention to that word, note that word in your mind, softly. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, in other words, they said to themselves, boy, wouldn't it be awesome if the south wind would blow softly, then we're going to take that as a sure sign that we're in the right place doing the right thing and on the right track here with our decisions. It was a good sign. Supposing they'd obtained desire, they went ahead and they went for it. They put out to sea on that basis and they sailed close to Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called a Eurocliden. A Eurocliden essentially is the equivalent of a nor'easter up in here in New England carrying snow. Well, this Eurocliden was a nor'easter at sea. So you notice what happened. The wind blows softly. A nice, gentle blowing of the wind. It gave false information to them. They relied on circumstantial evidence instead of the word of the Lord. And they sailed right into a nor'easter that tore the ship apart. And the south wind blows softly sometimes in people's lives. Think of how people, in America even, all around the world for that matter, the wind was blowing softly for them, they were making money, life was going on, and all of a sudden this little virus comes out of China, infiltrates the whole earth, and now what was once important no longer matters at all to people. What they thought they were once in control of, they realized I'm not in control of anything. What they thought they could do, they can no longer do. Everything is turned upside down by a nameless, faceless bacteria. It's incredible. They supposed that they had their purpose. They thought everything was lining up exactly the way we want. We're going to go. We're going to make a fortune on this wheat cargo. We're going to do our thing in record time. And so many people look at the south wind blowing softly and they assume that because God hasn't judged them and the lightning has not struck their lives that everything is cool, everything is good. I can go on living the way I'm living. Now we find ourselves where people are stuck in their homes, afraid of everything that's going on. Very fearful indeed. See, these mariners thought they could make the extra distance to Phoenix And now we realize that's a sign, beware when the south wind blows softly, especially when it blows into the teeth of what God says is ultimate truth in his word. Just because the wind seems to blow softly, it provides circumstantial evidence that the what I'm doing is right. But the Bible says there there, there are ways that seem right unto a man, but the end of the pathway is the way of death. Be careful of what we think is right we got to subscribe to what God says is right. Because it almost cost these guys their lives, if not for the grace of God. Too many people have been lured away by the soft wind. It's too easy, it's all too easy to take from favorable circumstances and use those as the deciding factor in the matter of guidance and ignore the sterner counsel of God's word. The devil can set situations in motion that appear so appealing to the human eye and intellect, but they actually hide a snake on the inside. See, the captain and the centurion both had an inner conviction, and they were both wrong. They decided that Fair Haven was too, too poor of an anchorage place for the winter. So Phoenix would be much better, they thought, so much better that it seemed it was worth the gamble. They both had what seemed like confirming circumstances with this south wind that I referred to. They congratulated each other, no doubt, on their remarkable good luck and fortune. 
They also, however, on the other hand, had the warning of the apostle, the warning of the word of God, which they rejected with disastrous results as being contrary to their own liking. We can never ignore God's word and allow other considerations to outweigh the truth of God's word. We can never, if you're a Christian tonight, never make a key decision without finding God's mind, God's heart, God's direction on that matter. Make your quiet time with the Lord the most important part of your day, the most important part of your life, because there are so many voices, there's so much evidence that appears to dictate this and that and the other thing. Let the Lord be the final deciding voice. Number four, the fourth thing that we can extract from Paul's journey is this. Men cannot fix what God has broken. Men cannot fix what God has broken. And guess what? The Lord tried to warn them, but because they went ahead, the Lord knew the storm was there. The Lord allowed that storm because there was a bigger purpose ready to be played out, which we will get to in our next segment. But look at the scripture, Acts 27 and verse 17. It says, when they had taken it on board, they used the cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and they were so driven. So what these guys did was they had these huge cables. They actually dropped the cables around the ship, essentially to hold the ship together because the waves were, so, were crashing with such ferocity that they knew for sure our ship is just going to blow apart. And so they tried their best to hold together what God was wanting to blow apart. And all the human effort in the world, all of the effort that they made with all of the cabling did not ultimately hold the ship together. Why? Because when God breaks something, man cannot fix it. You see the second scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 13. Ecclesiastes 7, 13 says, Consider the work of God, Solomon said, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? Sometimes the Lord does something that makes no sense to the human mind because he sees the end from the beginning and he's always looking at his bigger heavenly purpose and what it's going to take for that to play out is in the domain of his ultimate wisdom and sovereign care. Remember, dear friends, take stock in the midst of the storm. It may not be as bad as we think it is. There could be things going on for our good that we can't see because the stormy seas are raging all around us. Have you ever decided to worry about something? Have you found yourself worried, sick about something that you didn't need to worry about? How many times have we worried about things that never happened? All of us have been there. And the ironic part is, while they seem terrible, the things we worried about may not have been as bad indeed as we thought that they were. So we need to stand still for a moment and take stock in the midst of storms. And number five, this brings us to number five. The fifth and final thing we're going to cover is... This fact, in tough times, be diligent to take personal inventory. In tough times, be diligent to take personal inventory. One of the greatest things that difficult times do is it causes people to slow down and look at things from a different perspective. It causes people to stop in their tracks sometimes. I say this all the time at funerals that I do. I tell the people that show up for a funeral of a loved one or a colleague or a business associate and said, look, if you don't think that your lives are all over the place, look at what it took to get us all in this room for this one hour of time. It took the death of someone that we all know just to get us to close our schedule temporarily for an hour here or an hour there. That's how much people are running their lives running all over the place, in many, and in many cases with wrong priorities driving them. So we need to take stock. Look at Acts 27, 18 and 19. Acts 27, verses 18 and 19. Paul said, 
I'm sorry, Luke is writing this. Luke said, we took such a violent battering from the storm that, ne that the next day they began throwing the cargo overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. This is an incredible statement because it means that all hope was now lost. The cargo was a massive amount of money going out the window. The ship's tackle was the only thing you had to repair things, to help the navigational equipment. When you throw the tackle overboard, pretty much it's a game changer. It's over. That's how desperate these men were. You see, here's the point. Difficult days frequently are used by God to get us to push the reset button on our priorities. See, so you see the next morning they began to throw the cargo overboard. Guess what? The captain, the owner, the prophets were now unimportant. They're going off overboard. Probably the water level had begun to rise in the hold of the ship to such an extent that it was making it impossible because when you have dry grain and then you add water to that grain, it just enlarges and enlarges. And so if they had any hope at all of surviving the storms, they had to start offloading stuff before the cargo itself was responsible for sinking them. So sprung boards in the ship's hull probably allowed so much water into the grain that it was about to sink them. For another night and all the next day, all hands were on deck heaving overboard the tackling of the ship, which included this immense beam that was probably as long as the ship, and it took all the men to get that thing over. You know, one would secure that if possible, but in the severity of the storm, everything was gone. Interesting, isn't it, that in a crisis like this, there was no longer a distinction made between valuable and cheap cargo. It all became dangerous. It all became the same. They do not discard all the cargo all at once because ships like this were often said they carried 68 tons and large ships such as this one usually carried over 250 tons of cargo and some could actually carry 1,200 tons of cargo. So therefore, you can imagine unloading a ship like this in port would take about 12 days. So hurling merchandise like this into the sea obviously required less caution, but the crew certainly could not have finished this task in one day, but they did their best. They were desperate for their lives. The grain was probably stored in stacks about six feet high, sacks six feet high, which could be moved manually with great effort in the best of circumstances. But without the equipment available in port, this was a nightmare. But they were desperate to be freed from the weight. Now, let's just take it this way. What did the cargo represent? Their livelihood. What did the tackle represent? Their own security blanket. Both had to go. Their own plans, their own dreams, their own agendas. There's the cargo. No longer important. All the plans they had, no longer important. The tackle of the ship, their own way of doing things, their own security, no longer important. So when we take times like this, I think it's important that we take inventory in these areas. Spiritually, where are we with God? How is our spiritual life? I'm convinced that many, many people around the world are scared to death right now during this coronavirus plague because they don't have a relationship with Christ. Therefore, they don't know where they're going and they fear death uh, with a tr tremendous amount of fear, and it's gripping every moment of their lives. So we need to take spiritual inventory. Next, we need to take natural inventory. You know what? Maybe I need to consider um, things that are natural in my life. 
you know what, when I get through this, maybe I'm going to start to exercise. Maybe I'm going to change some things about my schedule. Even coming down to this, instead of just uh, feeling trapped in your home, take advantage of it. Read, write, do something creative. Clean out some clutter. Get rid of some stuff that's just been laying around. Take some time to clear your life out and set your life on a new track because the natural part might be reflective of your spiritual and emotional part as well. So spiritually, naturally, take inventory concerning your family. Where are you in reference to your family? Where are you in reference to your relationships that should be the most important? Are you relating to your family? Are we taking time together? How about your relationships in general as a friend? Are you a good friend? How are you doing relationally with people? Say, well, honestly, I've been more into myself than friends. Well, maybe it's time to change all that. Why? Certainly in this plague, amid this plague, tomorrow is not promised to anyone. And then last, take inventory of your commitments. Are you committed to God? Are you committed to church? Are you committed in your giving? I couldn't help but think for the last two weeks, as my wife Debbie so aptly put already, believers in other nations that can't go to church, that have to meet by candlelight in a darkened basement for fear of their lives. Maybe we're getting a little tiny taste of what they experience as normative. And maybe it's time for Amer the American church to wake up when this passes by, God help us if we remain the same in our commitment to God, church, family, giving, serving. We need to let this affect us. And sometimes the Lord will allow something to go on for a season of time so that it sinks in and not just passes by so that we can get back to our business of life. Notice that in this storm, the things that seemed important suddenly lost their value. For everyone on this ship. But storms, sometimes, the upside is that it makes it easier to really see priorities for what they are as opposed to what they should have been. And like those sailors, folks generally start listening to godly guidance and other voices that they should have been listening to when things get tough enough. Sometimes people have to hit the bottom of the barrel before they're willing to get help before they're willing to ask for help, before they're willing to recognize that they need help and that their friend on the bar stool next to them is not going to be the one to give it. Psalm 32 in verses 8 and 9. Psalm 32 verses 8 and 9. The apostle, I'm sorry, the Lord says this. Psalm of David. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. This is the Lord speaking. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding which must be harnessed with the bit and the bridle, or else they will not come near you. The Lord said, I want you to come to me. You've got to come to me, but don't be like the horse and the mule, where if the reins aren't pulled back and the bit and bridle aren't pulled, they never come. The Lord says, don't be like that. I want to instruct you. I want to guide you. I want to teach you. I want to lead you in a path of life that will bless you. Priorities. And I'll finish with this as a true testimony of a pastor from Kansas. Um, he said, a cousin of mine had been confined to bed with cancer for more than six months. However, she made an ardent and painful attempt to attend a concert that she had long anticipated despite her illness. I was lucky enough to be seated next to her at the concert. I leaned over and asked her, what have you learned from your experiences with cancer? She said, well, I've learned that it's easy to say goodbye to all kinds of unimportant things. I've learned that it's easy to say goodbye to material things. I what I am having a difficult time with is saying goodbye to those people who are closest to me, who mean so much to me. And I am grateful, however, that there is one relationship, my relationship with Jesus in eternity, that I won't ever have to say goodbye to. Wouldn't you agree that that lady her, had her priorities sorted out just right? And that's what we need to do when we're in the midst of storms. Then we'll be able to take right action and see the blessing of the Lord. Let me close in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for everyone that's listening tonight. 
We pray that you would bless them, that their hearts would not have fear, that their hearts would have faith. Lord, that you are in control. You are the Lord of the storms. Psalm 29 says you are the Lord enthroned over the floods. You are the one that can speak peace to the wind and the waves of this world, the wind and the waves of this hysteria that we're experiencing now. And if we listen closely, we will hear you say, peace, be still. For that, we thank you, Lord Jesus, and we ask all this in your wonderful name. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Thanks for joining us today. What an awesome time we had together. Don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, at Victory Church, and on Instagram at Find Victory. Lastly, don't forget to check out rvictory.org for more information. And before we go, there is nothing more powerful than to experience the service firsthand. So we would like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut, and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. So come on out and find find yourself yourself at at Victory. Victory.